we have examined a number of scenarios to account for Earth's catastrophe cycle. If you need one event to explain the isotopes, the impactors, the cycle, the ancient stories, and the magnitude of the event, one must look to the Sun as the front-running candidate in our neighborhood, triggered by the galaxy or not. In the last two episodes, we began looking at how some of this might play out with Earth's crust, and built upon that to discuss the wind. In this episode, we hear from the full Nova panel, Dr. Dunning, Douglas Vogt, and myself. We will examine some of the evidence on the moon right from the people who were there, and then we will see the potential evidence of the Nova in those samples collected. Finally, we will examine a terrible possibility that falls within mainstream physics in the universe and would apply to Earth in a micronova or superflare scenario. We'll begin with the evidence from the moon, first in testimony, then in hand. I don't know what this is, uh, John here at me, Houston, but I'm gonna pick it up because, uh, anything that stares at you, you better yeah, pick it up. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a glass, but uh, in this sunlight, it's reflecting red, green, like, the, like a rainbow. Found the first prism on the moon, John. Something like that. Uh, ten rock frags, a couple of which are, uh, one of which is some interesting black glass along the sides of it, another of which is covered with black glass, and, uh, many little glass beads all over the place here, John. Oh, boy, that was, uh, one of those fractures that's all included with, uh, glass. Okay. Yeah, so those glass, uh, fracture sets. Huh? I think the after on this one will be pretty interesting. Here's a rock with glass splatter all over its body. Hey, Tony, I just picked up one that uh, is in bag 15 that is uh, has a black matrix, bluish black matrix with uh, lap-like uh, either clasped or uh, phenocrist in it. And uh, it's right behind the limb here. I don't know whether that's what we're looking for or not. Okay, that sounds it's, good, Charlie. Uh, this seems to be one of the main reasons, in fact, all these missions talk about this. They talk about this glass splatter and these glass uh, debris um, uh, samples they're picking up on the moon, which makes me believe that they were up there looking for glass splatters. They were looking for evidence of solar effects on the moon. And I think that the Chinese went up there on the far side of the moon to do exactly the same thing. Young set up an ultraviolet camera to provide the first astronomical observations from the moon. He took pictures of the Earth's upper atmosphere and magnetosphere and their interaction with the solar wind. They look like drill holes is what they look like. You do that in West Texas and you get a rattlesnake. Here you get permanently shattered soil. How about rolling that one over? No way. Whitish to gray with a lot of zap pits in it. Yeah. In fact, uh, Tony, uh, the whole area, there's a lot of this rock. There's a lot of this rock here. These are interesting because they had a glazed surface on top, a 64455 sample. It was this glazed top on it. And then in another part of that sample, there were all these pellet shots in it. So we see that these things have, have occurred not once not twice, maybe many times, that the glass splatters are happening on these rocks, and then at another time you get more of these impacts, and, and we're seeing this in these samples on the moon. I think it's a very, very strong evidence path that our sun has a micronova event in a very regular period of time, and that we're seeing these samples on the moon uh, as evidence of these events. Don't step right there, Charlie. Here's a splatter, glass splatter. Oh, well, yeah, I see it. A whole big bubble of it in it. Yeah. In the Hubble time lapse of uh, V838, which is the Monocerotus Nova that happened back in 2002 or one or two, when they started recording this, over a four to five year period, you see this huge expanding shell of matter coming off the star. Uh, it didn't supernova and destroy itself. The star is still there. But there's this huge shell that's expanding out into space, an enormous amount of debris. Now, any planets uh, uh, going around that star 
would be hit by such incredible a mass of material spreading out very quickly and causing all sorts of damage. So when we see other stars doing this, we, and we do an analogy of our own star, or analog of our own star doing this, we see that when this happens, there's a really big issue with heating, debris, irradiation, all the sort of things that, that we see in these past events on our planet, and that the Vostok ice core is showing all these carbon dioxide events. <laughs> it could just be from all the burning going on after the solar flare happens. It would be the most dynamic coronal mass ejection in modern history, recreating its spectrum through plasma interaction as it expands and cools. The shockwave has the chance to be the two in a one-two punch. In the last episode, we discussed how a super flare or micronova creates electric wind of cosmic rays, how those could create geomagnetic storms that would take out global power. But in space weather, the biggest concern is the double impact, the consecutive shock scenario. And in the case of a micronova, or even the super flares that mainstream science says are possible on the sun every few thousand years, there is a concern for the lower level L-shell magnetic fields, the smaller arches instead of the global fields connecting to the polar regions. In most solar blasts, even the worst ones we only see every decade or so now, the magnetosphere of Earth compresses down to those outer L-shells, but still connects to the polar region in the most exposed outer zones. But in the extreme scenario, it could be very different. The modeling of the Great Solar Storm of 1859, for example, which lit telegraph wires on fire and shocked operators, came close to hitting the lowest level L shells. And if that were to actually happen on Earth in a super flare or micronova, then you get the potential for a magnetar-type discharge, where its own processes are thought to surge energy through its L shell fields, arc down, and literally crack the surface of the star. At that point, the loss of power grids might be one of the lesser concerns. As for the electric geology, lab results confirm this action on terrestrial planets. The only question is, did it happen before and could it happen again? Let's hear from Dr. Anthony Peratt once again on the king of plasma discharge column formations, the 56 filament form. Uh, what's called the four o'clock rapids, 56 uh, concentric, actually it's less than that because these have started to undergo rotation. They have started to, as Kirkland filaments, they have started to rotate around each other. Uh, here's one on the Navajo Reservation. Next one, we go to Australia. This is near Derby, Australia. This is uh, Bronze Shield, Third Millennium, Middle East. Going to pick this one up. Uh, this is a 56 ray from Kazakhstan. Uh, it's 56 rays, it, it doesn't have the inner concentric uh, rings. Okay, uh, somebody locked the doors because at this point people are gonna start escaping, but this is a 56 ray circle axis mundi from uh, China. And these are actually drawn as uh, paintbrushes. You know, the axis uh, mundi uh, here, the tree coming up in the center. But anyway, the 56 are there. Uh, this one, I've forgotten where it is, but again, it has a 56 rays. Uh, that one again is in um, in uh, uh, Arizona. So the same thing. Pick that one up. Uh, this is unfair. I picked the penumbra of a dense plasma focus, which also has 56, but it's a plasma, so we, we would expect it to have 56, and it does. Uh, Dome ceiling, Fifth Street uh, Church, uh, Seattle. This is uh, very close to the uh, Forbidden City of China uh, ceiling picture. These ceiling pictures show up, and they generally have uh, 56. Uh, uh, periodicity around the side. So if people remembered this and it's sacrosanct and they continue to use it over and over again. This is brand new. This is the uh, uh, Grand Atrium in uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, which is brand new. And uh, again, they, they didn't draw it circular, but they certainly put uh, uh, eight times seven uh, panels of light around here as well as some structure in, in the center. That's uh, Neolithic stone ruins. This is the uh, Canela village, uh, north central Brazil, has uh, very interesting. They uh, have these uh, 56 avenues coming out and, uh, and a house, a village house on, on each side. So, so there are 56 Berkeley filaments in our intense aurora that happened perhaps four millennia ago. So now when we have planets with magnetic fields like Mars used to have, three and a half million, a billion years ago. And we have these very large 
solar events coming out, these electric events hitting a magnetic field and collapsing it onto the surface, it could very easily scar out a huge area, continent distance, 3,000 mile scar like Valmarineris. Now, we see this as a possibility on many of these early, early planetary events and scars on the surface of, of planets because as these planets were much closer, as these periodic micronova occurred, they would be collapsing magnetic fields close to the surface, causing the scarring, causing the stuff. And every time these things happen, it blows a little bit of atmosphere and ocean off of these planets and moves them a little further out. And that certainly happened to Mars. We know that when it lost its magnetic field, it just was inundated with solar energy and just blew the ocean right off the planet, blew the atmosphere right off the planet. And if you look back in time, the same thing seems to be happening here. Our oceans have gone down, you know, hundreds of feet every 20,000 years. Something's blowing the ocean off. Is that what they taught you in school? Because they gave you it nice and coded. But uh, again, remember, the people in the U.S. government who saw the sun flare up and get the information back from the, the moon when, when we brought the stuff back, they were mostly scared. The sun does something terrible. They didn't know when. They felt they had no power to change it. You see, our tools have, have shown us things that they couldn't have possibly seen 50 and 70 years ago. There are cycles upon cycles upon cycles. Anybody who knows computers know they're synchronizing and resynchronizing frequencies in computers. So the point is, unless you look at the universe as information, you can never figure any of this stuff out. And out of their ignorance, they change things the way they believe them, not the way they really are. So now you're within 27 plus years of maybe our utter complete and total destruction. And some of us have the unenviable task of trying to separate the lies from the truth.